might do sometimes. Or we're just not sure. We're just not told. But the thing is, you know, looking on Facebook the other day, and that's where I got the idea for this morning's lesson, really, is that a gentleman posted all this stuff going through all the evidence showing why December 25th is not Jesus' actual birthday. And the lady wrote back on it, yeah, we understand this. But now's the time when people are kind of maybe focused a little bit more on spiritual things. Now's the time during the rest of the year you know, it's all about physical. But it seems like now, during this time of year, people start to think more about spiritual things, especially the one that we call Jesus Christ, of course, because of the Christmas season. So what I would like to do this morning with Tyrant the Cow is I want to ask you three questions. And really, these three questions, each and every one of us that are gathered here this morning, we can ask ourselves about the answer. And in fact, I would dare say these three questions need to be asked by everybody in the world today. And we need to have a solid answer to these questions. The three questions are simply this. Who is Jesus Christ? That's a good start. The second question is, what has Jesus done for me? And then, of course, the third question is, what must I do for Jesus Christ? Now, when I was down with Sebastian, I did a three-week mini series on this. So you're getting a condensed, condensed version of what I did down there. Okay. So first question, who is Jesus Christ? Well, in a nutshell, the one answer we can see here, he is, he is God. And I know there's a lot of people out there who don't believe that Jesus is deity. They kind of look at Jesus as a created being. But first, In verse number 11. 
He says, for my own sake, this is God talking through Isaiah, even for my own sake will I do it. For how should my name be put? But notice this last statement, and I will not give my glory to another. God, Jehovah, states here from the inspired prophet Isaiah, I will not share my glory, the glory that I have, with any other. It's not going to happen. God does not share his glory. Let's go over to John chapter 17, verse number 5. John chapter 17 and verse number 5. Here Jesus, as he's lifting up his eyes uh, to the Father in prayer, would state this. And now, O Father, glorify thy me with thy own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. God doesn't share his glory, but Jesus has. What does that indicate to us right there? Jesus is, is God. We can go through time and time and time and the rest of the prophet Zechariah and the things that he said would happen to Jehovah. We read in the New Testament, who did they happen to? They happened to Jesus. Jesus is God. He's <laughs> a being God. And there's, some, there's a certain right, if you, if you call it, that Jesus has. Now, what you look in Acts chapter 17, beginning verse number 30. Acts chapter 17, beginning verse number 30. If you're Paul, you're familiar with this account. He's there and he's been preaching at the Athenian. And he would make this statement as he's trying to convince them of the one God. So at the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now he made an attempt at every man. Everywhere to repent. Now, why would God want every man to repent? Well, he explains it first. <coughs> because he, being God, hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And there will be a judgment. The house will be. By that man whom he has ordained. There is one individual that he has ordained in order to carry out the judgment of everyone. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus is God. Therefore, he has the right to come and to judge each and every one. This is who Jesus Christ is. And I need to go through and talk about a whole bunch of things. But these are two important uh, aspects of him that I want to make sure that we understand. He is God, and therefore he has the right and the privilege to look at me and to look at you and to look at the life that we have done here upon this earth and to make judgment of us. Now, I understand that we are, I can't do that with you. I can't condemn you to hell, and I can't commend you to heaven. I don't have that right, I don't have that privilege. Jesus does because he is God. Look at uh, first, second Corinthians, excuse me, second Corinthians chapter five. Now, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, last week, I believe Brother Ed uh, quoted this verse for me. And usually when we go to second Corinthians chapter five, verse number 10, we'll read that verse and we'll stop. I don't think Brother Ed did that. He kind of alluded to something else, and I appreciated that when he did it. But it reads, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Usually we stop right there. I like verse number one. He says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. What's the terror of the Lord? John 1. Verse number 10. That's what he's talking about. Appearing before the very God of heaven, Jesus Christ, and him making judgment on my soul. That can be terrifying. But notice what he says out there. Knowing this terror, we, we go out and preach the gospel to individuals. But there will be a judgment that is coming when all this takes place. So, real quick, who is Jesus Christ this morning for our lesson? He is God. He is the one that will make judgment on my soul. Now, when you think about that, that's an awful lot of power, isn't it? You know, usually when we think of men and they have power here in this world, they just like to pop them up and get more and more. And it's all about the, 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 the,
Christ in the newspaper all the time about. But what has Jesus Christ done for me? What has Jesus Christ done for me? <coughs> we'll talk about the death on the cross here in a minute. But if there's something else I want you to know and understand that Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. Young people, especially those of you who are thinking about going to college and you have these tenured uh, professors, they'll teach you anything, and they'll start complaining about the very God of heaven, especially what he did in the Old Testament. They'll be like Richard Dawkins in his book, the, the, the Do uh, God Delusion, in his introduction, he gives like 14 adjectives describe, describing God, bloodthirsty, benevolent, jealous, raging, all these other things. They get that because of what God did in the Old Testament. And they'll say, how can you believe in a God that is so vicious? I want you to think about this. What has Jesus Christ done for us? The very first thing I want you to see in talking about this, go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse number 21. Here Paul is writing to the Roman congregation there. It has both Jews and Gentiles in it. And it looks to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, chapter 1 is talking to the Gentiles pretty much. Chapter 2, he transitions and he starts talking to the Jews. And then chapter 3, he just kind of wishes it together. And of course, his conclusion in chapter 3 is where all sin and shall come short of the will of God. But in chapter 1, again, he's talking primarily to uh, the Gentiles in that congregation. We want to start in verse number 25. It says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creator, the creature, more than the creator, who is blessed forever and ever. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against them. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lives one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of their error that was me. Notice verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God and their God, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What were the Gentiles doing back then? They were rebelling against God. They were sitting there, you know, they kind of be like the child and their parents, and the child was screaming at their, uh, their mother and father, berating them, kicking at them, scratching them, spitting in their face, just total rebellion. That's what the Gentiles were going to God. What did God do? What did Jesus Christ do to these individuals? You know, we would sit there and we'd say, just get rid of them. I have nothing to do with Jesus Christ, God, didn't do that. Go back into Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Here Paul, <coughs> excuse me, is preaching in Lystra, a Gentile city. Okay, so he's, he, he, he's preaching to Gentiles again, the same ones that he was talking to in Romans. Notice what he says, beginning in verse number um, 16. Acts, Acts chapter 14. Who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. That's what he wrote to the Romans, right? They belong to us, they find, run to what they want. Nevertheless, even though God did that, and they were rebelling against him, notice what he said. He left uh, not himself without witness, and that he did good, notice this, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. Filling our hearts with food and gladness. That's God. That's what Jesus Christ did for these reprobate people who were rebelling against him. Back in the garden. What happened? Adam and Eve sinned against God. God had the right at that point to just stop in the time. Absolutely. Think about the days of Noah, Genesis 6, 7, and 8. What was the world like back then? Well, it was filled with all sorts of wickedness, evil thoughts continually in the hearts of men. I'm paraphrasing what it says. Could God have wiped out everybody there? Yeah, he did. But especially, and I love this, 
Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Your very life here upon this earth, you owe the Lord called Jesus Christ may not. He gives it to us. You think that air that you breathe is work? You think that food you eat is good? We don't think about that. We take all of this physical stuff that gives us life with my very heart beating. You think I got like that? This comes from God Almighty. And we should be so very thankful. This is what Jesus Christ, the sovereign creator of this universe, God has done for us. But not only that, go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning verse number 18. Now we get to, to what most people think when they think about what Jesus has done for them. 1 Peter chapter 3, <coughs> in verse number 18. He says, For Christ also has once suffered for us, the just for the end, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the body of the Spirit. Now Peter is talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. When he went to that cross at Calvary, he had the nails driven through his hands and feet and hung up there so everybody could see it. That's what he's talking about. But notice these things that Peter said. The very first thing he says, Christ has also suffered for <coughs> the sin. There's a religious organization or a like, thought, I guess, a theology, if you will, out there that states that Jesus didn't die for us. He only died for an elect few. And that elect few was predetermined before the creation of the world. So if you're not part of it, God doesn't want you. That's basically what it says. You're worthless to God. You're not predetermined. So I'll already do it. Now what this verse is about. Notice again, for Christ has also suffered for sin. To get more clarification of this, go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Let me give verse number 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sin. Notice it. And not for our own, not just for John and Mary. Writing. It's not just to the people that he was writing to, okay? Notice whose death Jesus Christ, uh, notice whose Jesus Christ's death is for. But also for the sins of the whole world. Brother Mark took us through this morning in a Bible class. He was asking us the question, to think of the sins that we've committed in that life. Secret sins, the most abominable sin that we can think of in this thing. Do you know that when Jesus died on that cross, he did it for everybody who ever lived from Adam until the time of God? That's what Jesus Christ has done for me. That's what he's done for you. Notice also that in 1 Peter chapter 3, the second thing that said, the just for the other. Just for the end Now there's a, I don't know how prevalent it is, but I've heard there's some argumentation, I guess we'll say some debate as to did Jesus, was Jesus' death on the cross a substitution for my death? And there are different thoughts on that. Um, good arguments on both sides. Uh, but when I read what Peter wrote here, the just for the unjust. I can't help it, but envision, if you will, substitution. It reminds me of when Jesus is there before Pilate. And remember that individual called Barabbas? Now here he was, and they were supposed to set a prisoner free because that's what kind of year it was. And Pilate asked him, um, I'm thinking just my personal opinion, that Pilate was hoping that they would say, free Jesus because Barabbas was this terrible person. 
You know, maybe he, he wouldn't have to worry about, he wouldn't have to go through this, this thing of having Jesus in the body. But what did they choose? Who did they people choose? They chose to have the rabbis the roots in Jesus' probably You know, when Jesus was on that cross there in the book of Luke, I believe it's called, in chapter 42, and he had those two thieves that were rattled on him, and, and one of them came to his senses, and he said, you know, we, we deserve this. But this man here, he's done nothing wrong. But yet he's being put in place of I can't get the visionary vision of substitution out of my mind when I look at it. The just for the unjust. Who are the unjust? In Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Now begin to verse number 9. Paul the Bible. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise. For we have uh, before proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throne is an open sepulchre, and their tongue they have uh, used to see a poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and murder. Their feet are swift to uh, shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that the things, uh, now what things, uh, so whatever saith the law, is saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty. Before God. Therefore, by the means of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Go down to verse number 23. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who's the unjust? It's me. I'm the unjust. I committed crime. I've done evil. I've been a wicked person. And I, it reminds me, I need to go on one other thing that Jesus Christ did. I'll make sure I get to that before we are. So we probably won't finish the third, third question. Yeah, that's okay. I'm the unjust. We're all the unjust. But who took our place? Jesus Christ. He took my place. I deserve that death. And when I'm talking about death, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the death that is expressed in the book of Revelation. The lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. A place void of good. A place void of God. The eternal world. The eternal world. That's what I deserve. But because of what Jesus did for me, I have the opportunity not to suffer. I have that opportunity. Go over to 1 Peter chapter, on 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. And there's one thought that you fit my mind and I got a comment for you. But it's a good support. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 7 it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Now some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah, you know, I said I was the wicked person. I was the terrible person. For 33 years of my life, God allowed me to be on this earth, rebelling against Him. Why? <clears throat> you ever wonder why? You ever wonder why Jesus is not coming? Like these people were. Where's the, Where's He coming? Where did He have to come? Because of God's long suffering. This is what God. This is what Jesus does for you. His long suffering. We now go over to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And this is, this is, I say, this is beautiful. Verse number 4. Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. For despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee 
to repay. Why Jesus had to come back? Because of God's goodness towards you and towards me. For 33 years, I lived in rebellion to God. For 33 years, God's long suffering that He showed me gave me one more day to come to the knowledge of the truth. People say God doesn't do anything. I say God does nothing. And it, it, it still amazes me, and I'm still in shock when I think about it. He allowed me one more day. This is the God of Jesus. This is Jesus Christ. He's not the individual that a lot of people like to put out there like Dawkins and Hitchin. He's not. He has compassion for his creation. He could have wiped us out again long ago. He didn't. He kept us going. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill up the earth. Do it again. And then his long suffering. Not willing that any should perish, should perish but all should be repentance. If you're here this morning, and we've only gone over the two questions, what must I do for Jesus Christ? Well, that's your repentance. Jesus is God. Okay? There is no question about that. He will be our judge on the day of judgment. But even though He wields all that power, Look what he has done for each and every one of us. He has, he's kept me alive on his planet. On his earth. And after that he did. Gave me everything I needed to do. But not only that, he sent his son to Calvary to die that cross, on that cross because I deserve it. I deserve my death. But God was not willing that I should suffer that. So he did it for you. And this morning, you have. God has given you one more day to think about your soul. Where do you stand in the sight of Almighty God? I know there are individuals out there in this audience today who have not put on Christ in water grave baptism. Why? After everything that he has done for you, why do you put on? Follows my own. This morning, if you don't know what you need to do, to do for Jesus Christ because what he has done for you, let me know. There are many individuals here that would love to sit down with God's holy word and study what you need to do. Once you come to that knowledge, then you just simply know that. But if you know what you need to do, you sat in the audience, you studied some of the scriptures, you know what you need to do. Why are you waiting? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent, to change your mind about sin? Are you willing to confess His name before men? And to simply and finally have your sins washed away in that water during the baptism? This is what I must do for Jesus Christ, based upon what He has done for me. And of course, live faithfully the rest of my life until I die or until Jesus comes back to try to come. Tell you that. But maybe you've done this in the past and yet you find, for whatever reason it might be, you've lost some of your sense of who Jesus is and what He's done for you. And you've allowed Satan to get under your skin. And you let sin enter back into your life. If something of a private nature, we implore you to go to him in prayer, asking for his forgiveness. You know, that's something else that Jesus does for us, but we don't have time to go to him. He's our mediator between us and the Father. We pray through him to the Father. So we can go to him in prayer, asking for forgiveness. And what Jesus is going to do is going to take you before the Father in heaven. And your Father will forgive you. That's what Jesus is about. Okay? But something of a public nature, something that others know about, we simply implore you to come forward and let me know. And we'll pray to the congregation, we'll pray with you and for you. If you've repented of the thing, God will forgive you. But again, think about your position with this one that we call Jesus Christ. 
Think about everything that He has done for you. Would you like to bring Him to stay? If you have any, let me know.